All right, the live action adaptation of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Let's fix that thing. Before I start, disclaimer, I actually enjoyed this 2017 adaptation and had a smile on my face most of the time and even teared up when I got nostalgic, so do not murder me and set my corpse on fire over me stating that this movie is objectively problematic and inferior to the original, and I know that there are plenty of tweaks that could have made this thing so much better and make people hate it less because a lot of people hate it, and like I said, I'm not one of those people, but I can't help but vocalize a huge missed opportunity and also explore what the problems were that people had with the film. And if I don't point out or correct an issue you may have had with the film, it's either because I didn't notice or it didn't bother me. So leave a comment telling me your issue and your ideal fix for that issue. Okay, let's dive right in. The main criticism I see surrounding this film is the casting of Emma Watson as Belle. I remember when she was announced for the role and people were losing their minds with excitement, myself included, because we all knew her as Hermione Granger from Harry Potter, who was smart and brave and loved books and was overall a very similar character to Belle, so many people saw her as a perfect fit. Now it's quite the controversial topic. Some say her singing was bad, some say her acting was weak, some say that her collaboration with the filmmakers and creating their version of Belle led to the character's vibe and iconic ball gown to be way too plain and bland so that she would be more active, less restrictive, and not like a typical princess, but it should have been extravagant and grand and stunning. Now, I personally have mixed feelings about Emma Watson playing Belle. On one hand, I I do really like her as a person and actress in general, especially because I grew up watching Harry Potter, and I think that both her history with the Belle-like character of Hermione Granger, as well as her real-life persona as a known advocate for feminism and equality, make her socially and culturally the best person for this role. The idea of Belle, Hermione, and Emma Watson herself all go hand in hand. They all fit together in the space of feminist heroes who break down barriers, are highly intelligent, love to read, do not take crap, and have kind hearts. So yes, idealistically, that's great. For pop culture appeal, that's great. And I'm totally convinced her presence is what made this film the mega success it was at the box office. People be having Harry Potter withdrawals, so when they see Emma Watson and magic and castles, they fork over their coins and then you factor in the fact that it is an iconic Disney movie being adapted and yeah, it was the perfect recipe. So if I was a business person, I probably wouldn't change anything about the casting, but creatively, I probably would. To make the film of the best quality and of the most satisfying nature, I would probably not have Emma Watson as Belle, even though her casting doesn't bother me to the degree it bothers many others. So yeah, her vibe within the actual film doesn't feel as much like the animated Belle as many had anticipated, but the main issue people have with her is she's not a singer. And not only is her singing voice nowhere near strong enough to sit in the shadow of the original voice of Belle, Paige O'Hara, but Disney took that tepid singing and auto-tuned the ever-loving hell out of it, to the point where she sounds like a robot. It would have been a thousand times better if they didn't go so heavy with the auto-tune and just let her lukewarm singing voice naturally come through because I actually am kind of intrigued by the idea of letting Belle have a more grounded, realistic singing voice instead of being a classically trained Broadway singer. But Disney probably should have either hired a singer to dub over her voice or cast someone else's Belle who they were confident enough in that they didn't have to resort to abusing autotune to the point of sounding like T-Pain. And while Emma did bring an interesting modern energy to the character, she did make her very plain Jane. She collaborated with the director and the costume designer to make sure that this contemporary version of Belle was not restricted by a corset or an extravagant dress or a cool hairstyle. She wanted her to be free and hippie and active and while that sounds nice, there isn't much cinematic value there and that's probably why the merchandising was a disaster. So if not Emma as Belle, then who? 
I always thought Lily Collins would have been the perfect live action Belle because not only does she give me extreme Belle energy, but she looks so much like her to the point where it'd be much easier to believe you're seeing the real life Belle when watching the movie. I mean, you know that artist that creates pieces that show what animated characters from Disney movies would look like in real life by grounding their features? Look at Belle, she looks like Lily Collins. And on top of that, she can sing, like, her father is Phil Collins, you know, the legend responsible for the Tarzan soundtrack. So, yeah, this is beyond wishful thinking because the movie was already made, but Lily Collins really would be such a great Belle and would bring a sense of life to the character, and I bet she would have no problem wearing costumes with actual cinematic appeal. But once again, I'm still neutral on Emma Watson, and I do love her as a public figure. Okay, so next issue to be fixed is not so much one that everybody is complaining about. I mean, I've heard a few people I personally know point this out, but it isn't a big thing online or amongst critics. The casting of the Beast is not great. Not terrible, but there are better choices. I think the characterization of the Beast in this adaptation is generally pretty bad, which I'll get into later, so some of my disdain towards the casting may just be because most everything around the depiction and creation of this version of the character is iffy. Dan Stevens, who played the Beast, didn't do a bad job, but some of his choices and line deliveries were just kind of weak and phoned in, especially when compared to the nuance of the voice performance and animation in the original. And he had no chemistry with Emma Watson at all, and he just overall didn't work for me as the Beast, especially Human Beast. Like, this is more funny to me than charming or quote-unquote sexy. I would have wanted Ryan Gosling, and actually Disney did want him for the role as well, but he turned it down so he could do La La Land, which funnily enough, Emma Watson turned down so she could do Beauty and the Beast. Why are people trying to hire Emma Watson for musicals? Anywho, if I was Disney, I'd adjust the schedule to make things work with Ryan Gosling, who I think would bring more of the gentleness and charm of the character out, instead of resorting to being an awful arse with no moments of vulnerability in between. And he just is a better fit visually for human form of the beast. If not him, I don't see why Chris Hemsworth or Liam Hemsworth or Army Hammer or Charlie Hunnam couldn't have done it. Okay, next is my last casting suggestion because I'm just gonna lightly throw this one out there because most people responded very well to Luke Evans as Gaston, and I did too, I thought he was great, but we're looking to go for perfect, and maybe just maybe Henry Cavill, who is bulkier, more muscular, has a deeper voice, looks more like the cartoon, and has a real butt chin instead of a fake one drawn on, could be a better Gaston. I don't know if he can sing, and that's the fatal flaw of this suggestion, because Luke Evans can definitely sing, but Henry Cavill would have been so great in every other way, so if I were the director in charge, and this was my movie starring Lily Collins and Ryan Gosling, I would have cast Henry Cavill as Gaston, and if he couldn't sing, get a real singer to dub over him like they used to do in the old Hollywood days. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into non-casting territory. What should I complain about first? Oh, I mentioned how the characterization of the Beast was awful. Let's dive into that. So, the Beast in this version was a real butthole jerk with not many redeeming moments. Mixed out with the lack of chemistry between the leads and you have a central romance that's not convincing at all. So, how is this Beast a jerk? And isn't that the point for him to be a jerk in the beginning? Well, for example, in the 1991 animated Beauty and the Beast, the Beast was a jerk with a temper, but we got to see small increments of his heart in between his rages. You often could see he felt bad after being mean or having a freak out, and he often does little things to show that he's got a good soul. When Belle is first locked into the tower, he insists that she gets her own bedroom instead, and personally takes her to the room so that she is more comfortable. While in the 2017 film, the Beast leaves her in the tower, and Lumia and Cogsworth are the ones who show her to her bedroom. It seems like a minor difference, but it means so much in terms of building the dynamic between Belle and Beast. 
1991 Beast comes across as having genuine glimpses of empathy, where 2017 Beast is just a narcissist with no hints of redemption, and when he does do something nice, it seems as if he's only doing it to manipulate Belle into breaking the curse, not because he actually cares for her, he just cares what she's capable of. Another example of him being a wanker is the scene when he gives Belle the library. In the animation, he wanted to do something special for Belle, out of the kindness of his heart because he had genuine feelings for her. In the live action film, they're talking about books, she says Romeo and Juliet is her favourite and he rolls his eyes and condescends her because he's so above it and the conversation of books ends up leading to him being like, oh yeah, I have a library and then he shows her and to flex even harder he's like, yeah, you can have it or whatever. Like, how are we supposed to believe that he cares for her? How are we supposed to believe they're falling in love when he's just a poo bag? There are so many instances like this throughout the film, I can't cover them all, but the romance is so much more convincing in the original, in part because the beast is much more sweet and charming. So in my ideal version, he would be more sweet and charming. Another thing that contributes to a lack of chemistry, an unconvincing love story, and an overall iffiness surrounding the beast is the CGI of the beast. Most of the CGI in the movie is incredible, so there's no excuse that the beast looks as unfinished as he does. Like, this CGI may be passable now, but it will look incredibly dated in the next few years. It's distracting and it makes it hard for the audience to really connect. I think a problem is that they really tried to make him look soft in the face, possibly to compensate for the fact that he's a straight up prick. but. In trying to make his face gentle, especially around the eyes, there's very little contrast and depth, so it looks flat and artificial, and Dan Stevens, who wore a motion capture suit to play the beast, didn't wear anything to stabilize his skinny little neck, so his head bobs around and the movements look off when translated to CGI because this bulky beast isn't supposed to have so much mobility, so it just doesn't look right. They originally were going to use animatronics for the beast, which I think look loads better, but they scrapped the idea. Maybe because they wanted more organic expressions, but why not at least model the CGI after the animatronics that they already made as an example so they can achieve a more realistic look. In my ideal version of Beauty and the Beast, the beast would look better and generally be a better written, more likeable character. Since we sort of just tackled the problems with the Beast, and some of which included the problematic writing and depiction of the character, especially when compared to the original, I'm going to talk about the movie's overall feeling of hollowness that not only can be blamed on said depiction of the Beast and the flat central romance, but a lack of depth in its direction and creative choices, once again in comparison to the original. Now, this film and all the other live-action Disney adaptations claim to be more complex, detailed versions of their animated counterparts, and that's pretty much true with their longer run times and further explorations, but with Beauty and the Beast, it's only seemingly true on a surface level. On the surface, it seems to have more depth because there's more happening. There's a longer runtime, things that were not elaborated on in the original are elaborated on here, but that just means it was overwritten. And for me, the original still has more depth and complexity despite being much simpler, and you can see it in the little moments that pack a way bigger punch in the animated movie. I'm not going to go through them all because there's way too many throughout, but an example would be the scene where Beast decides to let Belle go to help her father, which no longer is a moment of personal growth for the Beast because in this version, the stakes were made higher for his staff members who will not just remain enchanted objects if the last petal falls, but cease to exist. They will die. They will vanish. So he's basically sacrificing all their lives to let Belle leave. And given how this version of the Beast has been characterized, we're given the impression that the decision to let her go isn't so much an agonizing Sophie's choice between Belle helping her father and the lives of all his staff members, but more so a, uh, I'll let her go so she won't hate me, but I'm gonna be a beast forever, so that sucks, and oh yeah, that kinda sucks for my staff members that are gonna die. Another example is a small detail that makes a huge impact. 
when Belle is in the West Wing and B screams at her to leave and she runs off into the woods, in the animated movie he has a moment where he realizes his temper got the best of him and he made a huge mistake, where that doesn't happen in the live action film, so we're just left to assume he feels confident and comfortable in his anger and has no regrets or empathy. It's little stuff like that that adds up into making this more hollow and with less payoff. They needed to add more moments of humanizing the beast, showing regret for his actions and strengthening his relationship with Belle. If they added a scene where Belle and Beast start talking and Belle tells him that his staff is scared of him and he should respect and value them more, and I don't know, maybe it's ridiculous that they feel accountable for not doing something when his father twisted him up to be awful despite the fact they live in a damn monarchy and did not have the power to do anything about it, and then Beast starts to show guilt and regret and is like, I didn't realize, I guess I've only been thinking of myself or something like that. That could be a step forward in really letting this underdeveloped relationship actually feel earned. Also, why didn't they give the Beast a name? Like, she just calls him Beast. Isn't that a bit degrading? I guess it's Disney canon that his name is Adam, so why not call him Adam, at least in the end? Okay, let's talk about this magic transporting book. This is absolutely pointless and is completely discarded after one scene in which they travel to Paris so Belle can learn more about her mother, which is like, okay? Belle could have learned about her mother in another way for one, and for two, Belle learning about her mother does nothing for her character or the story, which Whatever, I personally don't care if they want to explore Belle's mother, but I know some people find it unnecessary because it doesn't empower or influence Belle in any way. And if they had to have the magic book, have an actual purpose for it, bring it back later on. When Beast lets Belle go to save her father, she's crunching for time, yet she goes to the village on her horse, and it takes an entire song for her to just get past the gates of the castle. She could have just transported to the village with the magic book. There's plenty they could have done with this enchanted book, but they force it in there to explain why this Disney princess never had a mom. If they wanted to add the book and the backstory of the mom, they could have made it more sophisticated and complex. Make it known that Belle is uncomfortable in her own skin and is insecure about her being odd and different and ambitious, but then she discovers that her mother was also seen by everyone as a freak, but she was innovative, ahead of her time, which empowers Belle to let her guard down and embrace herself, which helps her to care for the beast because you can only love others when you love yourself or something like that. And then the magic book, like I said, make it be how Belle goes home when Beast lets her go. Or they could use it to travel on a special date before they go back to the castle for the iconic dance scene. Speaking of the dance scene, how underwhelming and empty it was. To explain my point, I'm going to compare this scene to the iconic dance scene in the live-action Cinderella. In Cinderella, not only is Ella's ball gown much more cinematic, grand, and visually stunning than Belle's underwhelming, bland, plain gown, which should have been gold rather than that cheap yellow color, but the way in which each sequence is filmed and orchestrated is very different. In Cinderella, which probably has the most beautiful dance sequence I've ever seen, it's so romantic and intimate because in addition to the stunning wide shots, we get a lot of close-up shots of the two characters connecting. We can hear their breaths, their giggles, and they're having the time of their lives as well as falling deeply in love. In Beauty and the Beast, it's mostly wide shots. We can't really see the two connecting. We don't see any smiling or joy. The CGI on the beast is distracting, there's this one beautiful part near the end, but other than that, it's pretty lifeless. And in comparison to the animated movie where they're actually enjoying themselves, there's a grander sense to it. Maybe it has something to do with all the grand windows creating a feeling of openness in the ballroom which are not there in the live action. Okay, now let's talk about what was advertised as the first ever openly gay Disney character, LeFou, the villain's sidekick whose name literally translates to the fool. What a gift to the gays. And the only moment that even hints 
at gay is lefou incidentally dancing with another man for a split second why not have cogsworth be gay or lumiere bisexual the damn wardrobe could be les there were better options for lgbtq plus representation than lefou and the quote-unquote gay content should have been more blatant. Disney has the power to help shape how life goes forward by having LGBTQ plus protagonists in their films to give young people of the community characters that validate them, represent them, and make them feel accepted and not alone, to make them not feel abnormal, and also to change how hateful people view individuals of the LGBTQ plus community by normalizing them and making them prevalent in their media. This depiction of LeFou did nothing for progression. Also, the Enchantress stuff is not thought out very well. Why is she supposed to be seen as a positive character when she cursed all of these innocent people? Why not make her kind of villainous? What if at the end of the movie, when the last petal has fallen and the beast is dead and Belle is crying over his body, we give her a moment to grieve and accept his death and maybe a while has passed and she's laying on his body and the enchantress creeps in. Belle's like, who are you? And the enchantress is like, it seems as if the last petal has fallen and the curse has been cemented. Belle concludes that she is the one responsible for the curse and begs her to reverse it and bring the beast back. The enchantress is like, what's done is done. I gave him the opportunity, but he couldn't prove that he was redeemable. He disregarded me as some funny woman and then got to see what this funny woman was truly capable of. Belle replies by saying, In my village, they call me a funny girl. I know how it feels to not be valued, to not be understood, but the beast helped me realize that what makes me different is what makes me special, and I love him. And the enchantress starts to feel sympathy, but she says, I'm sorry, and walks away. Belle continues to cry over the beast's body, and while the enchantress is walking outside of the castle in the rain because it should have been raining during the climax because that added so much impact in the animation she has an epiphany and turns back cut back to bell and then the petals begin to rise and the beast slowly transforms back into a human and it's ryan gosling okay so there's plenty more to be fixed the musical sequences especially gaston and little town needed more energy and imagination and the film overall needed to understand that overwriting something does not make it more deep. They needed to do the work if they wanted to pack an emotional punch. So yeah, I enjoy the movie for what it is, but a lot of people hate it and it's easy to see why. It's undeniably problematic and I can't help but picture what a perfect live action adaptation of Disney's Beauty and the Beast would look like.